Uh, good evening and welcome everybody. Um, this is a special pleasure this evening as President of the Royal Society of Edinburgh to introduce um, our guest speaker this evening, Chris West, who is the new director of the uh, Royal Zoological Society um, Zoo uh, in Edinburgh. Uh, recently arrived from, uh, from Australia, but previously with extensive experience at London Zoo uh, and many, many uh, strands to his bow in terms of the preservation of animal species, um, of uh, developing a, a, um, environments in enclosed zoos where they can replicate environments of the wild. So a, a, a real enthusiast. The title of um, the, the, the lecture this evening is From Gannets to Pandas, and I will leave it to the speaker to explain where the gannets come from. We know where the pandas, where the pandas are, uh, but we'll leave it to them to, to, to explain. And we're also um, very pleased to welcome uh, Professor Roger Wheater, who is a predecessor at, um, uh, director of the zoo and still a huge enthusiast um, of the zoo in Edinburgh here. But without more ado, I think we want to hear what Chris has got to say. So here's Chris West to tell us about From, uh, from Gannets to Pandas. Over to you, Chris. Thank you very much, President, fellows, ladies and gentlemen, friends and supporters of the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland. It's a great pleasure to be here this evening to talk to you about the progress of Edinburgh Zoo over the last hundred years. And it, it is from gannets to pandas and beyond. And I'll explain the gannet part of it as I go. But I thought I would start by just sharing something that I set down which catches how I feel about what I do. A few weeks ago, I walked to the top of Kostorfin Hill. As you know, that's quite a hill. And I caught my breath, and I waited for the sun to rise. I looked down the hill, through mature trees to the mansion house, and over towards the Pentland Hills, I blocked out the sprawl of orange sodium streetlights and I imagined what it might have been like for Thomas Haining Gillespie as he started his life's work translating energy and vision into creating a zoological park for the abiding benefit of the people of Edinburgh and Scotland. And in my mind, I asked him how he thought the old place was doing as it approached its 100th birthday on July the 22nd this year. And in my mind, I experienced a range of feelings from pride and privilege to excitement and resolve. And I walked down the hill holding a sense of continuity and stewardship. And I thought that Gillespie, as the animating spirit founder of the zoo and of the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland, would be pleased with the old place, but in no way complacent. I also thought that he would be appalled at much of what humanity has done to nature in the name of progress since he retired at the end of March in 1950. The natural world that he was so fascinated by and shared so passionately with so many people is battered and shrunken and under increasing threat. And I felt we shared a question or two. Is this the best we can do? What inheritance do we leave behind us? This is a talk about 100 years of progress. It could have been three talks. It has three parts with perhaps a short postscript to address any curiosity there might be about pandas and their sex lives. <laughs> I guess there might be. The first part is a retrospective passage to chart aspects of the story of Edinburgh Zoo, its trials and challenges, how it's adapted and survived through world wars, economic depression, social changes, 
amazing technological advances and leaps in scientific knowledge, not least in the field of animal sciences. It is inevitably a bit of a gallop alongside perhaps 40 million or so visitors. And I'll be sharing some swift impressions and I'll be referring to great characters and eccentrics, both animals and human. <laughs> the second part is a pause, a moment of reflection, if you like, as we turn around from looking back and see ourselves as we are today, the strengths and the challenges, an opportunity to consider how different Edinburgh Zoo is now, what sort of unique niche it occupies, and what it does for conservation, education, and the community that I think many people may be unaware of. We're a little understated. We are much more than just a zoo. And the third part is in part an exercise in the art and science of futurology, just thinking about some of the global and local trends and context in which we have to find a way to make the greatest contribution possible to ensure a healthy planet. Because we are, after all, both conservationists and humanitarians. So there is Thomas Haney Gillespie, the animating spirit of the zoo. And this is the book that he wrote, which was published in 1964. And I commend it to you. Um, the passages in it really carry the essence of the man. And in 1913, as he and others were planning and building a cutting edge zoo on the Kostorfin Hill House estate, purchased for £17,000 at that time by the City Council, for which we are still obviously very grateful. In 1913, far away in a cage in Cincinnati Zoo, lived Martha, a female passenger pigeon. She was the last of her kind. And if we can go back for a moment another hundred years to 1813, when there were less than a billion human beings on our planet, Napoleon was on his way back from an unsuccessful trip to Moscow. The Industrial Revolution was a gleam in the eye. And John James Audubon, the American ornithologist, observed a flock of passenger pigeons. It took three days to fly overhead. Three days. Try to visualize a flock of birds taking three days to fly overhead. A hundred years later, they'd all gone, mostly shot. And the point is that Edinburgh Zoo was born into a world that was already changing, but I think the people who founded it could be forgiven for assuming that nature then was still pretty much boundless. The gannet. The very first animal in the zoo was a gannet. It was blown ashore at Leith, and Thomas Gillespie purchased it from a pet shop for the princely sum of 18 pennies. And it lived in the zoo. It was immature. I found a picture of it, but it was so small and fuzzy and a dark immature gannet that I thought if I showed it to you, you might think I'd contrived any sort of picture. <laughs> it was barely recognizable as a bird. When the zoo opened, it relied on a traveling animal uh, collection that was borrowed or hired for a period of time. And the passengers, uh, passages in Gillespie's book that described the arrival by train and the procession through Kostorfin and the unpacking of the animals is terrific. It's highly recommended. There's just one little part of it that sticks particularly in my mind. At the end of a very long and hot and tiring day, they had just unpacked half a dozen wolves into the new wolf house. And as they walked around the corner of the wolf house, 
presumably heading towards a cup of tea or something more fortifying, they met a wolf. <laughs> and they realized, he, he puts it very delicately, oops, as it were, they hadn't thought that wolves dig. And it was an earth floor. So they had to catch the wolves, and put them back in their traveling containers, and then make sure the floor was cemented. So the first part of my talk is about the history of the zoo. And in looking at it and thinking about it, I think it is just so remarkable, reflecting on how different the world was. Those are motor carriages parked up outside the mansion house, where we now have conferences, weddings, and our offices. There's King George V with his arm through the arm of cousin Nicky, otherwise known as Tsar, Nic excuse me, Tsar Nicholas II, Tsar of all the Russias, who had just a few years left to sit on his throne, actually, to live. Women didn't have the vote. Grand Duke Franz Ferdinand, Crown Prince, hadn't gone for his unfortunate drive through Sarajevo. Scottish soldiers were distributed across the empire in which the sun hadn't yet set as part of the policing of the empire. But somewhere down south, deep south, South Atlantic, South Georgia, something was happening. And that something was that the Salveson whaling fleet was starting the relationship that we still enjoy with the Salveson and Elliot family to this day as great friends and supporters. Because what they were doing was catching some penguins and some seals to bring up to Edinburgh Zoo. And that's why the coat of arms that we have has a king penguin and a seal holding up the shield, and across the top of the shield, rendered mature and sparkling white, and identifiably, and identifiably so, a gannet. So that is the very first bird at the zoo. And it's a funny thing, because I was imagining the sailors capturing young penguins, and I realized I was doing it in black and white because all the photographs are in black and white. Or well, sometimes there's a sepia tinge. So I thought I'd put a photograph in because this is what they'd have actually seen, brown, fluffy penguin chicks, and they'd have caught them up. And I hadn't got a photograph of that particular first arrival. So I've put this one in. It's a, a later arrival. It demonstrates not just the changing fashion over time, but the interest and the proximity of the public when they arrived, and the momentary indignity, I think, for the penguin that's just been <laughs> lifted out of the back of the lorry. But this started the great thread of tradition of penguins at Edinburgh Zoo. And we were pioneers then, and have been throughout, the first zoo to have penguins in the Northern Hemisphere, the first zoo to breed king penguins. And again, the passages in Gillespie's book are terrific. He addresses how they named the penguins based on their character and takes you through their behavior and then confesses, if you like, that they got it wrong in quite a few cases. And that Andrew, the husband, the patriarch, who'd been put on his own for some unstated social misdemeanor, laid an egg and had to be renamed. No wonder he was socially awkward. <laughs> so uh, there's that lovely sense of pioneering and penguins. And then the start of the zoo in its early years attracted some amazing people, a range of artists and architects and inspired people who loved nature and crossed over between these different areas of human interest. That's a map from 1916, and the lower part of the zoo and the zoo still has some of the marks of the work of Professor Patrick Geddes and his son-in-law, Frank Muir, 
I had to show a picture of Geddes because I think that's just a wonderful beard and it's one I shall aspire to in due course. But I haven't got the head of hair. Never mind. The thread of the Penguin story continuing on through to the modern day. In 1951, a keeper on leaving the Penguin area left the gate open, and whether or not he was covering his tracks by doing that, as he walked away, he noticed some of the penguins were following him, walked down to the front of the zoo, a little way along Kostorfin Road, imagine that now, <laughs> and then walked back up again. And the penguins followed, because they like to do that. And to this day, we do the penguin parade, and the penguins do it because they want to. And sometimes there may be no penguins, but usually there are a few. And having watched it, I just marvel at the expression on people's faces because they get that sense of close proximity to beautiful wild animals, behaving in a way that penguins choose to behave. And of course we have Sir Niels Olaf, who's a king penguin, who's come up through the ranks, a meteoric rise through the ranks, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. Um, he's been colonel of the regiment. That is just the most brilliant photograph of him conducting an inspection of Norwegian soldiers over for the tattoo. And I spoke to the colonel in the Norwegian army who has been responsible for much of this relationship and he said to me that about a year ago he was talking to the King of Norway who said essentially I don't know what we can do now because the only next thing we can do is adopt him into the royal family. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you heard it here first. <laughs> I don't know that they'll actually go that far. Another photograph from the early, early days of the zoo, and it shows how magical it must have been to people then to meet animals up close. But of course there are things that we wouldn't and couldn't do today. Um, that's a pretty young elephant to be carrying people around. Um, the other thing we couldn't do today is remotely get the keepers to wear that sort of uniform. <laughs> And I looked at that, that's almost the first thing that struck me, the thought of what they would say if we even mentioned it. <laughs> but it is that magic of a zoo in a society, a community, that hasn't had the privilege of meeting animals like that. And of course, perceptions were different. What was normal was different. There were PG tips, Brookbond PG tips, advertisements with chimps dressed up as little furry humans. It wasn't seen to be wrong or jarring to do this. So it was part of the experience at Edinburgh Zoo. I'm not sure of that picture in the middle at the bottom where I think he was called Philip, the chimpan that's the chimpanzee, <laughs> is about to share a cigarette with the keeper. And I think keepers should not smoke while they're working. <laughs> The bottom right-hand picture, imagine the health and safety executive <laughs> nowadays, quite apart from the unfortunate product endorsement that's, that's going on. Um, so we wouldn't do that, and uh, quite seriously for us, it is about presenting animals in a naturalistic environment that is as close as we can get to how they would be in the wild and allows them to express the widest range possible of natural behaviours. So Edinburgh Zoo made its way through two world wars and a Great Depression and tremendous social pressure. During the wars, the animals of course were rationed. It was difficult to get all the right foodstuffs. Members of staff went off to fight in the war. Belts were tightened, but somehow the zoo got through, partly because people couldn't go on holiday elsewhere, so they still visited the zoo, but also because of that tremendous resilience and support from membership and fellows to contribute and make sure the zoo made it through. And after the Second World War, 
during the period of people from the military being demobbed, one of them ended up in Edinburgh Zoo. It's the one on the right, it's Wojciech, the soldier bear, who was an enlisted bear in a Polish regiment. And he traveled from North Africa right up Italy. And there are some remarkable photographs of him manhandling artillery shells during the battle at Monte Cassino. And it really does appear as though he is carrying those shells, which is a testament to how bonded he was with the men of the Polish regiment. In any case, after the war, he couldn't go back to Poland, nor could they. And he ended up at Edinburgh Zoo, where we gave him a comfortable retirement. And he was very happy. If Thomas Gillespie was one of the first giants and the founder, then there was another enormous contribution and character in the history of Edinburgh Zoo, and that, of course, is Roger Weeter. Roger there pictured looking not so very different. He's the one with the tie <laughs> behind the young gentleman in a, an interesting hat, introducing him to a sea lion. Um, just in passing to comment that that pool is still there, of course. It's part of the original design. But the water volume and the water quality is such that we cannot put sea lions in there now, and we have to think about what else we can do. But I see Roger as the person who brought Edinburgh Zoo into the modern era, who was about conservation, who knew about animals. And on his watch, not only did the society incorporate the Highland Wildlife Park, and I'm going to just step aside from Edinburgh Zoo for a moment and, and, and carry out a sort of commercial break. For those of you who haven't been to the Highland Wildlife Park, you really should, because it's wonderful. It's beautiful in the Cairngorms landscape with species of animals that live in that sort of climate. It's a vision of what Scotland would have been like with many of the species. It's a vision of what it could be like, and it's beautiful. So you must go there, please. In Roger's time, the Highland Wildlife Park joined the society. And in addition to modernizing Edinburgh Zoo, Roger was part of a very small group of leadership figures in the international zoo community who drew on each other's experience. And in Edinburgh, the pioneering work we did with our education programs and with our breeding programs and stud book management. And that was extended and extrapolated and coordinated and networked through the British and Irish Association, the European Association, and the World Association. And Roger is still seen as an elder statesman. If I may describe him as a godfather, <laughs> no, maybe not, that has other connotations, <laughs> but as somebody who helped not just Edinburgh Zoo, but many, many zoos modernize. Of course, while Roger was in charge at Edinburgh Zoo, for 26 years, just over a quarter of the whole history of the zoo, a lot else happened. But I don't think we can draw a connection between Roger being in charge at Edinburgh's zoo and sort of raising hemlines and fashion statements about peace and love and awful psychedelic moments. If Geddes had a good beard, then he's got a rotten beard, would be my comment. And, and during Roger's time, but again, possibly not directly connected, we put humans on the moon. It was a period of enormous technological and social change. It was also a time when you'll recall that people could encounter living animals in nature in their living rooms through the medium of nature television and people like Gerald Durrell, Jane Goodall, David Attenborough in a way that they couldn't before. And I think that that had two effects. One was that it kindled the enthusiasm and the interest in nature that was complementary to that 
expressed by good zoos. But the other thing it did was it meant that people could see how the animals actually lived in the wild, what their natural behavior was, what their habitat was like. So I think that had that dual effect. People like Attenborough and Goodall very clearly see, saw and see a role for good zoos, education and securing a future for endangered species. They are pro-good zoos. And Doral, of course, founded one in Jersey. And I just let you ponder his words there because he'd have said that during the 1970s and they ring true today. That was very prophetic. They're still true today. Mm. So, as people learnt more about how animals lived and how they needed to be looked after to provide for them, there were two things. One, an internal sense within zoos, people's own sense of what's right about looking after animals in the right way. And also, building pressure and concern and scrutiny from people who were uncomfortable about animals being kept in captivity and sometimes not being kept in the best of conditions. So I think that Edinburgh made the right decision and a courageous decision not to keep species like elephants because in order to do so, given their size and strength and intelligence and social behavior and longevity, you have to really do it properly. And if you can't do it properly, you shouldn't do it. I'm bringing us up to the modern day now and just putting this up because in Gillespie's time, earlier on in Zoo's evolution, really it was about looking after animals with some breeding. If you look at a profile of Edinburgh Zoo now, it does many more things. If we look at captive breeding there, being a genetic reservoir, being a sort of refugee camp, holding species in being that would otherwise disappear. The example there is of a parchula snail. They're little Polynesian tree snails. They're about the size of your little fingernail. They're not very dramatic. They don't do a lot. But behind the scenes at Edinburgh Zoo, we have parchula snails of species that have disappeared in the wild. They're extinct. If we didn't have green-fingered people looking after them and somehow they managed to look after them better than other zoos do, they would have gone. That's the essence of what we do. And then we do field support as well. Just one example would be how we're partners in the beaver trial. This is the legal beavers in Argyle as opposed to the naughty ones on Tayside that got there somehow. And our skills in the field and our research and veterinary skills mean that we're part of that trial. I couldn't find, there are so many training examples that I've just put a quirky one in there. We don't actually have to train the penguins to eat fish. They do that all of their own. But we do a whole range of different sorts of technical veterinary, husbandry and other trainings. And for research, I thought it was probably topical to put a picture of spermatozoa, and I'll talk a little bit more about the research that we do in a moment. Moving up to the gentleman with a beetle on his nose, education. Last year, Edinburgh Zoo was visited by 811,000 people. A bit more than usual because of the attraction of pandas. Incidentally, the Highland Wildlife Park had 126,000 visitors too. That was a record year as well. Um, but we had 23,000 school children come on organised education visits to Edinburgh Zoo last year, which is a very large number. We'd like it to be more. But that lies at the heart of what zoos can do. You might be wondering why I've got a picture of an endemic, cuddly Scottish mammal with its thumbs up um, <laughs> down below. Let me explain. That has to do with advocacy. People like coming to the zoo, so opinion formers, decision makers, people in politics and media 
and others like to visit the zoo and then we have the opportunity to talk to them, to have a conversation and point certain things out. I'd like to say that's a, a, a sort of live image of a response when we said we want to do something very exciting for Scottish wildlife, just give us some money. But um, <laughs> that's yet to happen. Now Jeremy's sitting in the front row, Jeremy Pete, who's our board chair, wondering why I have a picture of him possibly. And it's not because he um, has a slight refrain at board meetings about the need for financial viability, although there is a touch of that. It's to point out that we're an interesting creature. We're a charity and we're a visitor attraction. So a lot of people, I think, assume that we are funded by the government as our friends and people who we work with and respect greatly in the gallery and the museum and the gardens are, at least to some extent. We don't get that, so we have to be self-sufficient, so we have to charge some sort of entry fee. But that goes towards all the other things around this schematic, the education, the breeding, the field support, and the training. Without that public support and without membership support, we couldn't do the things that are so important. Just a little gallery here to go through quickly of some of the animals that we do breed that demonstrate that conservation is the heart of what we do. The top left image is a lady looking at a Sumatran tiger up close. It, it's kind of confusing, but then I hope it captures that magical moment when people can come up close to an animal that chooses to be close and looking out at them. The serious point is that there are about 300 Sumatran tigers left in the wild. There are about 6,000 tigers, period, left in the wild. There are more tigers in the States as pets than there are in the wild. It's likely that tigers are going to die out in the next 10 to 15 years in the wild if current trends continue. So it's really important that the pair of Sumatran tigers we have breed or if they don't, we change them with other partners and get them to breed, because otherwise they will disappear from the world. Pygmy hippos are under pressure, and we breed them. They're just like little blobs of licorice when they're born. Absolutely cute and wonderful. Giant anteaters, amazing, the adaptation and evolution. And they seem to like living up at the top of Kostorfin Hill because they've got a lot of very thick fur and they can handle the climate better than I can. Drills, bottom right, impressive, beautiful forest baboons, dwindling in number, facing possible extinction in the wild. We have to breed them in captivity or they'll go. And then I'd like to introduce you to a little lowest monkey. And if I may, Lord Steele, mention that that's the most recent addition to your extended family. Um, if I may put it that way, people are able to adopt our animals, and that's a way of saying thank you for being an adopter to that little lowest monkey. We don't always breed animals. In fact, sometimes we put them on birth control because the offspring have to have somewhere to go. This image to me says two things. One is that those are two young male Asian one-horned rhinos and our rhino facility currently isn't large enough and equipped for us to breed rhinos. So what we do is we look after young males and when they reach a certain age and stage they go on somewhere else and they join the European breeding program. It's all coordinated. It's like a, an enormous computer dating network. <laughs> Not that I have any experience of computer dating networks, I hasten to add. The other reason that I put this image up is it shows Darren McGarry, who has been at the zoo since practically before he was in short trousers and worked his way up from being a keeper through to being head of living collections. And I think Thomas Gillespie would just recognize in the look there that bond of trust and affection there is between those rhinos and that person. It's not just mammals, it's birds too. Blue-crowned laughing thrushes live in maybe six places in China, dwindling fast. Waldrop ibis, that's an unfortunate hairstyle. Um, 300 
Maybe left one site, Morocco, in the wild, bred in zoos, practically went extinct. The Socorro dove, none in the wild. If Edinburgh and a few other zoos didn't breed them, they'd be on the same list as the passenger pigeon. So what we do is population management. We do it in coordination with many other zoos. And at the last count, there were 20, 28, it's gone up, Gen 2 penguin eggs, which tells me two things. One is that they're recovering quickly from their travels, and two is that the new look penguin pool is just as good for them as the old one when it comes to breeding. And I think it's so much better for visitors too because they can see so much more. I imagine walking around the zoo a little with Thomas Gillespie and, and possibly the place where I think his jaw would drop most is the Budongo Trail. The architecture there, the scale, the fact that, as Jane Goodall said, if she was born as a chimpanzee today, she'd rather live there than in the wild because wild chimps are so beset by hunting for bushmeat and destruction of their habitat. So the quality of life we give the chimps is really, really good. But to me, a really important thing is it's a twin. And its twin is in Uganda. It's the field station. So by looking after and supporting that, we support the rainforest out there, we support the chimps, all the other species, and we're working with local communities in terms of their livelihood, ecotourism, and education. So Budongo, to me, is a strong model of what a modern zoo can do. It's just unfortunate chimps don't have very good table manners, isn't it? <laughs> but there we are. And there's more, of course. Uh, I could give many examples, but a couple more are the Pantanal in Brazil, where we have a team, and they've been looking at the secret life of the giant armadillo, about which very, very little is known, other than they're in fairly steep decline in terms of numbers. And the top left image is a world first. That's a mother, giant armadillo, and her baby in the first time that she's taking it out into the world at large. So that's a rather special photograph. Top right is one of our team who went out to Henderson Island in the South Pacific to help eradicate rats because they were destroying the endemic bird life. And the bottom right is simply a lovely textural photograph of a rhino's face and eye. It's no more than that, but I think it's lovely. To the science, we're working across many, many species and projects. We have a world-class molecular genetics laboratory behind the scenes partway up the hill. And that shows one of the team there working with ivory, and they've been involved in looking at ivory and rhino horn trade, illegal trade, and tracking it, and assisting the Thai government, amongst others, to set up their way of detecting what is illegal. The whole rhino horn thing is, of course, absurd. It's powdered toenails. It's keratin. It's really tragic. The same laboratory does many, many other projects, but one of the team is out in Saudi Arabia right now working on the genetic integrity of Arabian oryx, one of the first species to be reintroduced back into the wild. We've done work on the genetic health of the eagles, both white-tailed sea eagle and golden eagle in Scotland. All of the tigers in all European zoos use our laboratories or reference laboratory to check whether their genetics are right and how they should be bred. And our veterinary team are pioneers too. That shows one of them doing keyhole surgery on a big cat. And we teach that sort of surgery to many other vets. And here's an example of public awareness of science. So in a real way, it's sort of your research, we say to visitors, because they can pretty much take part. It's living links 
It's an amazing, innovative facility. It's in partnership between the zoo and the University of St Andrews Psychology Department and has received funding from the Wellcome Trust. And it's about public engagement with science, in this case, cognitive science. And it works very well for us because people love seeing monkeys. There's something about monkeys at an emotional level that speaks to us as humans, I suspect. And um, he can't be with us tonight, but Professor Andy Whiten, who is a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, um, is pictured there, sort of in a mirror image with a chimpanzee, um, reflecting on how closely related we are. At least that's what I like to think. That's not a comment about Andy. <laughs> Um, education, I've mentioned how it is central to what we do, how many children come through the zoo every year, and how they can have that magical, magical moment of touching and connecting and having a life-transforming moment with living wild animals. And with all of this, we still have, because we don't get any external funding, to provide an exciting, stimulating day out. So close-up contact with a male lion up against the glass, probably with many people wondering, how thick is that glass? <laughs> it's plenty thick enough, don't worry. The fact that we will put pumpkins in with the meerkats around Halloween they don't know it's Halloween, they're just very playful creatures, it's behavioural enrichment. But it allows us to give some sort of extra sense of fun, particularly with children who are visiting. And we keep meerkats, not because they're currently endangered, although who knows what the trends might bring, but because people do love them, they identify with them, and meerkats will interact in some way with them. It's like running a music festival, and having a really well-known band to attract people in, and then they'll enjoy all of the other music too. And we do sell cuddly toys, and we do have weddings and other functions, and we do have a first-class marketing function to remind people that there are special and fun things to see at the zoo. We have to. It's our lifeblood. And often I think people think of the zoo as an enclave of exotic animals that happens to be on a hill in Edinburgh. But much of what we're doing, and increasingly so, has to do with Scottish species. And we've worked with all of the species across this gallery. And there is a clear relevance and opportunity for us to make a difference, whether it's pine hoverflies, wildcats, beavers, palmate newts, or whatever. Now I want to just pause there. We are far more than just a zoo and things are continuing to change. But I want us to reflect for a little while on where we stand at this moment in human history. And I thought I'd start by summarising the whole of human history in a cartoon on one slide, in a way. And it's showing that at the advent of agriculture, we built a fence, and that fence was to keep out the wild, the menacing animals. And that fence has moved and moved and grown and grown and moved. And now what we're doing is keeping the wild in. The wild is a shrunken remnant of what it used to be. And zoos are part of what's inside that fence. There's a continuum nowadays from game parks, nature reserves, through to large zoos like Edinburgh, even larger spaces like the Highland Wildlife Park. So we are part of what is left of the wild. Excuse me. And this is the world we live in. So where is it heading? And just a little reminder that if we're about conservation, which I believe we are, then it has to do with the wild. That's not walking away from being a zoo at all. It's making the zoo a powerful engine for conservation. And I'm just going to share some thoughts and conversation I've had with an old colleague of mine who's the professor of conservation science at Cambridge, Andrew Barnford. And 
He's a very thoughtful person and a very strong academic person. And he's been moved to write a book called Wild Hope. And he's done that, I think, for two reasons. One is because there are examples and illustrations of projects and programs that do work, so we can learn from that. And the second reason, and it's interesting to see such an objective, logical, scientific person use the word, is he feels we have to use the word hope because it's positive, because the opposite of hope is despair, and that becomes self-fulfilling. So he feels very strongly that we have to have hope. And he talks about the glass being not so much half empty, but still half full. And here's the scorecard that I talked through with him about a week or so ago. He came up to give a lecture as part of our centenary series. We've lost about half of the space and the uh, population of animals and plants in the wild, very, very roughly. We're losing the rest, should we say, at about a percentage a year, 1% a year. So we know how quickly the sand is running through the timer. As one example, fish stocks are pretty much running out. They're over-exploited. There's a UNEP report out about a year ago that said that by 2050, marine fisheries would have crashed. That's kind of interesting, and it's in the future but then reflect on the fact that a billion people today rely on their daily protein from wild-caught marine fish. So it's serious. Extinction rates are a thousand times background and about 20% of species are already threatened. Why? I think we probably know the reasons why, but somehow they don't always get fully discussed when I was born, the global population, that's just over 53 years ago, was half what it is now. It's not just the fact that there are 7 billion people and it's rising to 9 billion people. It's the fact that we consume so much and certain areas of the world consume far more than others. There is inequity. But what it means is that we're running through at the equivalent of an estimates vary three or more planets as we're currently drawing down on natural capital. And people are increasingly urbanized. Sometime in 2007, more people in the world became urban dwellers with no real contact on a daily basis with wild plants or animals than living outside urban areas. That has one, that has lots of consequences, but there is one which is an increasing detachment, a feeling of divorce, if you like, from the natural world, and yet we are part of it. And then there's another aspect, which is we don't actually take into account fully the real costs and values. Short-term decisions are made on grounds of economic only growth benefits, and we're not counting the long-term cost. So why should we do anything because it's the right thing to do, I think. We've made the mess, we should tidy it up. We're having, or there's been a sort of binge party. Is it right to leave the hangover and the clearing up to other people? But it's also for aesthetic reasons, almost spiritual reasons. There's something about nature that we appreciate, that we like. It's beautiful, it's fascinating. We're part of it. And if that doesn't work, then try self-interest, the wild harvest, the value of fish and timber and medicines, and the ecological services. Difficult to describe because they're so interconnected and complicated, but phytoplankton and their effect on climate regulation, all sorts of ways in which nature affects human health, as broadly as having clean air, soil and water, or as simply as knowing that if there's a bit of green in an urban landscape, people actually are happier and healthier. Storm protection, that's a picture, the black and white one, of mangrove trees, very clear connection when the tsunami hit in the Indian Ocean about survival, and where there were mangrove trees, that buffered the, the tsunami. Similarly, wetlands and Hurricane Katrina and its effect on 
New Orleans. A topical one, pollination, and the use or not of certain pesticides with bees and the impact. What about the precautionary principle? What about consequences? So nature is worth about $3 trillion US a year to us, but we don't count it. In fact, we discount it. How does that relate to Edinburgh Zoo and the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland? It provides a context, it provides some direction, some imperative to what we can do. And here are some thoughts and pointers about where we feel we want to go. We want to continue being a leader. We are zoo-based. This isn't about stepping away from being a zoo. It is about conservation. And we practice integrated conservation, by which I mean it's interdisciplinary, that it spans the laboratory through the living collections to landscapes and working with people, communities. Conservation is about people too. And it's supported by strong science. And actually we'd be one of a relatively small number of organizations of a certain scale and size and ability that do that. And I think there's a central thing here. And Aubrey Manning gave a talk at the zoo about a month ago, and he caught it very well. And perhaps this is the most important thing that zoos can offer in future society. It's genuine nature-based experiences that allow people to connect not only with nature, but through a recognition of being part of nature, some sort of reassessment of ourselves. It's about humanity in the future world. That's a big sort of claim for zoos, but I think it's important. So we're focusing on what we're good at and what we can do working in partnership with other people. We're well practiced at collaboration from the days of Roger and collaborative breeding and research. We need to be innovative because we're a charity and we need to have a sustainable business. And one thing that we're very proud about, and it goes for pretty much all zoos, is they're the most socially inclusive institutions of all. Everybody goes to zoos. They have the widest wave band socio-economically of any institutions, even though they have to pay. So we feel that we're very much at the heart of the community and they're very much at the centre of what we do. And we want people of all abilities and disabilities, advantage and disadvantage, to be able to enjoy the zoo. I was reflecting and thinking, well, where do we stand against other organisations? Think of WWF, think of Durrell and the zoo in Jersey and the Wildlife Conservation Society in New York. And I think we sit somewhere in there as a zoo based organization, but we're a conservation organization now that does it through its enlightened management of modern zoos. The zoo, to go back to Kostorfin Hill for a moment, is a hundred years old. And I think it's important to say that we are going through a review process. It's a continuous cycle of review. It always happens. But we're thinking, well, some of the zoo is quite tired and old. Gillespie would recognize some of it, and that's not always a good thing. And we want to modernize it, but in a sensitive way. We want to look at the animals that we keep so that they're, yes, attractive to visitors, but there's a conservation and education relevance. And that just gives you some idea of some of the early thinking that we're going through there. And there are two things, as I start to conclude, that we're looking at during this our centenary year. If you like, think of them as front lines that we want to engage in. One is the hearts and minds of people, their understanding of nature, that we're part of nature, the importance of nature. We want to reconnect people. And we're a storytelling species, so why don't we do that through telling stories? There's a great oral tradition. We can catalyze a transformation in people. If you look at children's faces at the zoo, it's magical. And there's a, a nature deficit disorder that describes how people are actually 
not as healthy or happy, to put it very simply, if they don't connect with plants or animals. So we can provide for that. And around the zoo, we've got just the most wonderful cast of animals that we can use to hang stories on, uplifting, hopeful stories about the animals, their character, how they live, where they live. Yes, some of the problems they face, but how those problems can be met. And we are just that little bit fur and feather heavy in terms of the range of species that we keep. So we are looking at the reptiles, amphibians, fish, and invertebrates, invertebrates making up so much of biodiversity that we can keep. And I've just included a very patriotic spider there, <laughs> you'll notice, and it's actually called the St. Andrew's Cross Web Spider. So um, maybe we should get some sponsorship for showing it. It, it lives in, um, in the forests in New Guinea and northern Queensland, so, so this wouldn't be a, a natural habitat. In the top left-hand corner, just to, again, reinforce this point about storytelling and transformation and discovery, there we have a very young-looking David Attenborough, who's the storyteller, with a living animal on his shoulder, and an even younger-looking Prince Charles and Princess Anne, Princess Royal. And I'd like to know whether her finger got too close to that cockatoo's beak. <laughs> Maybe we'll ask her. Um, but I just wonder, it's a whimsical thought, was this the point at which something was planted so that many years later, when she was asked if she would like to be the patron of the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland, she said yes. That's the sort of thing we can do. The other front line, very quickly, has to do with the wild. And if we think of our own backyard, our heritage, natural heritage, our children's inheritance, and think of how shrunken the Caledonian forest is and how that's had an effect on the animals that would have lived in it. And we think about the Scottish wildcat as an iconic species that has dwindled in numbers. It could be less than 400, it could be less again. It's been persecuted, it's lost its habitat, it's hybridizing with feral domestic cats. And what can we do about that? Well, we have the science and the breeding capacity and the public education programs to work with others and make a real difference. And we want to look at how we can do that during our centenary year. Now, I can't give a talk like this, starting with the gannet and finishing with the pandas, without showing a picture of the pandas. That's Yangguan, and that is a photo micrograph of um, some semen of Yangguan's from uh, a recent moment, shall we say. Um, and of course, we really, really wanted there to be a natural mating. But in the final moment when Tian Tian's hormones were peaking, our experts and the Chinese expert, Professor Wang, were very clear that she wasn't in the mood <laughs> and that it would end in tears or worse. So because our imperative is to make sure there is a future for pandas, that pandas persist in our world, we did carry out artificial insemination on Tian Tian. And of course, that's what we're hoping for. And of course, it's incredibly cute. And it could be with us later on in the year. We're a charity. This isn't about making huge lots of money. If we have money, we put it into modernizing our site and we put it into education and research and conservation. And one way of looking at it is that this year, the pandas were a terrific sponsor for us and they wrote a check that allowed us to mend the penguin pool. Into the future, we'll be going to them and asking for more checks, as it were, and that's a wildcat kitten. That needs support too. So there is a direct <coughs> connection. It's a serious conservation project. There are 1,600 pandas left in the world. You can see from that map 
how their range has shrunk. And you know from recent events that they live in an area increasingly, it seems, prone to earthquakes. Every new panda is important. So I'm going to finish there, and I thought we might go back up the hill, Kostorfin Hill, and just wonder what it might be like a hundred years from now, and think that whoever's standing there, he or she, what echoes they'll feel, and hope that in our period of stewardship, we leave the zoo in good shape, and it makes a real difference, and that they're able to look down not only on the zoo, that's continuing to make a huge contribution to Scotland, but on a world that has turned a corner and is a better place. Thank you very much. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I think for the last hour, we have been magically in the hands of an artist who has been painting this picture of the development of the zoo. Um, I, I see it as a watercolor because there are layers that come with time. And I think the way in which he did it and the gentle approach to it was really very telling. And I'm sure that you will have lots of questions of him about it. But I don't think we can doubt in this new director, we have somebody who is absolutely passionate about these issues which he summarised at the end. So who would like to ask the first question? And please, um, uh, we've, we have microphones. Uh, the only limitation is that you shouldn't ask more than a, a question lasting more than a few sentences. And I determine how many sentences you can have. Okay, who's, who's going to be first? Don't be bashful. There we are, right at the back. I find that absolutely fascinating. I've heard you speak before, uh, and uh, it's always good, and it was even better tonight. Uh, my question is that in a recent edition of National Geographic, um, they questioned whether, given that it is now possible, or soon will be possible, to clone extinct species and reintroduce them into the wild, should we do that, or should we not? Yes, the question is about de-extinction using things like potentiated stem cells. I actually shared a platform with a, a couple of colleagues at the Science Festival, and we talked about seed banks and frozen zoos, and, and very interesting. Um, what I think is interesting, too, is that one of the people there had been at the meeting called by the National Geographic, and it seemed that the report in the National Geographic was just jumping the gun slightly. So the science isn't quite there. For example, bringing back passenger pigeons. My view is that we need to treat things very carefully and have an ethical approach to it. Um, it there is little doubt that technology and scientific innovation progresses and that we'll be presented with the opportunity of trying to bring certain things back and the Pyrenean Ibex has already been tried for example. Um, but if we bring back a passenger pigeon, is it going to be a passenger pigeon? It might have sufficient instinctive behaviour yeah. It might be possible to imprint it on some other sort of migratory pigeon, but it might not. If we bring back a thylacine, there might be enough areas in Tasmania to release them, but how is it going to know, to put it this way, that it's a thylacine? How much of its behaviour will be instinctive and how much is learned? If we go further back, and uh, there's a lot of excitement about frozen mammoths, and Siberia, then what we're talking about is a form of Jurassic Park, in my view. Mm -hmm. It's a theme park, and what we'd be recreating would be a freak, not something that has behavioral or ecological integrity, and I think we need to be very careful about that. So it's a question of being very selective, and it's just possible, and wouldn't it be wonderful if Martha actually wasn't 
the last passenger pigeon, and it was possible to bring them back, but we would have to approach it so carefully. My concern is that humanity is very good at discovering some new something and then playing with it before thinking about the consequences. Hmm. Right. Um, on the left-hand side. Uh, you mentioned art briefly. And I wanted to ask a question about art and artists and sculpture and artists in residence, please, and any future role and participation there might be in the planning. Thank you. It's, interestingly enough, there's been quite a discussion recently about how we can uh, recreate a residency program. And I think one of the things that is possible is to use poetry. They did it at Central Park Zoo. So art, sculpture, drama, all sorts of ways in which we express ourselves to forge an emotional connection between nature and humanity. So I'm all in favor of that, and we've started discussions on how we can do that. I detect a certain interest. Who's next? Uh, I'm very fond of Carol Barrett and mm -hmm. the art that she produced for you in the wonderful exhibition. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I quite like your huge bronze, is it, of the chimpanzee up in the Bodongo area, is he? Yes, well, and there's so a, an I just wondered if there was up, more. Oh, maybe it's an orangutan. I, I, I think that um, that sort of large art, particularly if children can climb on it or people can touch it, is wonderful. Um, so yes, I think health and safety permitting other priorities and our ability to, to make it happen, I think it would be a great thing. It would be great to be a, a sort of outdoor sculpture park and have all sorts of participative and art and drama, other things. We've got a few things to do though, so, you know, give us a, a few weeks maybe to... <laughs> Yes, there at the front. Um, I'm reading a wonderful book at the moment by Ruth Padel or Paddle, with, yeah. in which she is searching really for the title, the last tigers that are yeah. around the world. Yeah. Mm. And I just wondered what we could do with. <laughs> For instance, about China, who, who still have this idea that they can grind up the horns of some of creatures or they can take parts of tigers and, and make themselves better. And I just, how can we is somehow get rid of that attitude? Seems so dreadful. And I agree. I mean, I've been to China quite a few times and Japan and there are major differences in the standpoint and culture and tradition. And one of the things I've discovered, this was talking to Japanese um, Ministry of Fishery officials, is taking a, an absolute sort of Western viewpoint just breaks the conversation link right there. So I think it's a long-term engagement and education and working with. And I've noticed a, a shift in attitudes of the younger generation of Chinese people, their attitudes towards um, bear bile farming, for example. So they're not comfortable. And the more that they have access to uh, a different range of cultural norms and internet and so on in some way, the more that that will change things. But to take a, a sort of full-on frontal charge approach doesn't appear to work um, and and it's very very difficult and I've been places where I felt really beyond uncomfortable because of, of what I'm seeing um, so I, I think it is a question of constructive engagement somehow um, and education next question as HG Wells said you know human history is a race between education and catastrophe it's Sorry, question. that was a bit It's a cruel. question over here. Sorry, I, I sympathise with or empathise with your response, but I'm sure that I did, did just read in the last few days that 
the number of rhinos, I think, killed mm. has been the highest ever. Yeah. Um, so I think, as you say, that to rely on constructive engagement, yeah. that we could be talking yeah, 50 years. I don't think that's yes. going to work. No, I, uh, okay. With the rhino one, um, tigers, w we save what we can where we can. We engage at all levels with governments, with non-government authorities, through public awareness in the countries where tigers live. And, you know, it's all of the possible pressure points and leverage points and so on. And it's the same with rhinos. We had two people at the recent CITES conference in Bangkok, and they were talking behind the scenes with the Thai government and indirectly with Chinese lobby groups and, of course, with the African nations that are mostly being subjected to uh, rhino poaching, more than the Asian nations at this stage. And so it is applying pressure. And there's a, a sort of spectrum where you have activist campaigning with petitions where people are able to say, this is intolerable, unacceptable, we want a world with rhinos or tigers or whatever it might be, right the way through to uh, a scientific engagement and a government-to-government -government engagement. We need to press all of those buttons. I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not saying that with something like the current huge upsurge in rhino poaching in southern Africa, we should rely on constructive engagement. We should also be talking to governments about consequences. We should be and are talking to people in the Far East about how they need to enforce their regulations because they have the laws in place. So it's, it's a, a multi-faceted thing. Um, talking about constructive engagement is by no means saying that it's in any way condoned at all. It's appalling. Because, I mean, for instance, with whaling, mm. and, I mean, they, I think Greenpeace tried, mm. you know, they had an active yeah. campaign, and that didn't work. We're back yeah. to, I think, the number yeah. of whales being mm. attacked uh, as high as ever um, yes. from Japanese whalers. And, and I've been in Japan and in conversations, and not just... Um, conservative and, and patriotic Japanese people or government um, officials, westernized, educated, traveled Japanese have a huge anger at Greenpeace and other organizations because it's a hugely conformist society yeah. and the media management is done in, in a particular way. Um, so it, there needs to be that pressure put on and a clear recognition that other countries aren't happy with whaling. There needs to be a scientific approach saying that the means by which whales are caught is barbaric in terms of what happens to the whales. And there needs to be some other form of inducement or encouragement. But the thing I think is going to work and is beginning to work in Japan is that Youngsters are turning away from it. There's stockpiles of whale and dolphin meat that are not being eaten. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's a very careful, tactical and strategic approach with many, many touch points. But right. uh, yes, I share your views on whaling, of course. Chris, could I ask you about bring, bringing matters back to the zoo itself and the, and the, the, the area that mm. is occupied by the zoo? I mean, you mentioned that the sea lion pool would now Mm. no longer be suitable for purpose and that you're build, building a new or have built a new penguin pond. But do, do you see major changes in the enclosures and the way in which you present the environment at, at, at the zoo? I think over time there needs to be uh, a, certainly a, a reworking of some parts of the zoo where the facilities are um, past their immediate sell-by date or design specification, whatever the phraseology is. So yes, there are some species and some areas where we have got plans to modify things or replace things over time. It takes time and it's not cheap, but we are definitely looking at the species that we look after, 
the exhibits that we have them in. I, I don't want to say here and now, oh, we're going to do this or we're going to do the other, because that'll be no. received as not holy writ, but definitely going to happen. We're going through a careful process of reviewing things, looking at welfare, looking at visitor experience, looking at education, looking at the animals that we can keep that have the greatest conservation benefit, but knowing that we still have to attract people. So we're going through that whole thing. That's avoided your question a bit, hasn't it? I'm sorry. I'm going to ask Roger now to come and present a vote of thanks. Uh, President, fellows, ladies and gentlemen, when I heard that Chris had uh, accepted the appointment um, to be the new CEO of the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland, I was enormously pleased by this because I had known him when he was at London Zoo. And I also was very pleased to be invited to give a vote of thanks tonight. I wondered, I did wonder, and Chris and I didn't discuss in any kind of detail how this might be put together, and I did wonder how you would put it together. And I think you've done it absolutely brilliantly because you've actually given a flavor of, of uh, you, the President has described it as a, as a painting, but a, a flavor of what has happened in the zoo over the last hundred years. Gillespie were, was a wonderful man, and for its time, Edinburgh Zoo was just as good as any other zoo anywhere else. He started off by trying to do what was best in the zoo world at that time, taking Hagenbeck as his, his example uh, from um, work in, in Europe, uh, a more open zoo, but inevitably finances didn't allow him to make it as open as he would have liked, and of course it became quite a lot of bars. So there was a period of about 60 years where the zoo, uh, yes, it followed uh, the latest in animal husbandry, and in, in, uh, in, um, in, in welfare, ably abetted, I must admit, uh, and I would mention this here, by the Royal Dick. The Dick vet had a wonderful um, relationship with the zoo, and I was very sorry when that relationship finished four or five years ago, six years ago, perhaps. Um, sorry, too, that the acknowledgement that we should have given to the Dick vet at that time for various reasons, wasn't given. But the Dick Vet and the zoo worked very, very closely together for a long time uh, and were much involved in the whole matter of welfare and husbandry, as you might expect from that um, institution. There is a story. I, I, I can't but not tell one story about the zoo. Um, and this was in Tom Gillespie's time. The bear escaped, the zoo was cleared, and Gillespie armed with a shotgun, because there were no darts in those days, um, he, he, he went round the zoo to make sure everybody had, had, had been removed, all the visitors had been removed, and then he heard the sound of shuffling feet, and he thought, ah, here comes the bear, and he hid behind a tree, and then he poked his head round, and there was a dear old lady with a shopping bag, and she saw Mr. Gillespie and she said, Oh, Mr. Gillespie, I'm so pleased to see you. I've just had the most wonderful experience. I've met the most charming bear. <laughs> and I, 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 I've given him all my biscuits. <laughs> uh, and the bear, of course, as happens sometimes when animals escape from their enclosures, the one place they want to get back to is the enclosure, and the bear went back to the enclosure it's, itself. So that was that era, if you like. And then we move into the era, era of great change, and uh, you, you covered that very well indeed, um, Chris. The, the, the change in philosophy, the change in the questions being asked, well, what are zoos all about, and why do we have them, and is it right to have them the way we have them? And from that debate, and from those discussions, developed the captive breeding program that could only work if it was coordinated and cooperated throughout, not just Britain, but beyond Europe and the world, indeed the first tiger, um, um, a mer tiger that we got, a male that came from Minnesota, because it was the best one anywhere to go with the female that we had in a genetic sense. So that, that was all beginning to happen. Uh, and then, of course, the education program. 1961 was Paint and Zoo, first education program. We were number three after London. 
the development of the keeper training program, because the keepers are the people that are so important and vital, and it was vital to have a program that was common to the United Kingdom, and indeed that program has extended into Europe as well. The volunteer program, the involvement of people at a volunteer level, this all happened uh, during that next phase, if you like. And then we move into the today, and very importantly, tomorrow. Bodongo, and the Bodongo link with Bodongo Forest, a forest I know well, because I used to have my rest and recreation there when I worked in Uganda catching butterflies in the, in the forest. Um, and so that connection, and not just the connection with the forest, but the connection with the schools that surround the forest, the primary schools in the Masindi area, uh, that's all very important links. And I'm delighted that the society, under your guidance and under the guidance of the chairman and the board, has decided to use, perfectly logical, to use the anniversary of the 100 years of the zoo as the, as the jumping off point for the next 100 years. And you have given us some indication as to where uh, you might be taking us. And we are grateful to you for the way, not only that you've explained the last 100 years, but the thought that is being given at this very moment to the next 100 years. And we thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.